Hi, this is David Hillier here and I'm going to be giving a short video on risk statistics and this is in particular uh, with reference to the financial markets. I'll be looking at uh, one measure which is used everywhere in corporate finance and that's called variance and I will also be talking about another measure called value at risk and that is used really in the banking sector. It's not used in non-financial uh, institutions, but I like it and I think it's a good a good way of looking at risk. Now, what is risk? Well, risk is variability. It's uh, the risk that you lose something, but it could also be the risk that you gain something. And if you've got more variability, you're more likely to gain a lot or lose a lot. And you can see in my um, the right hand of the screen there, I've got the time series of the FTSE 250. That's the, the green one. And the FTSE 250 is smaller companies on the London Stock Exchange. You also see the time series of the FTSE 100, and that's the red colour. And the FTSE 100 is the largest company, an index of the largest companies on the London Stock Exchange. So we would always say that smaller companies tend to be riskier than larger companies. And if you look at the time series of the large versus the small, this is large, this is small, then you can see that the larger companies are less variable or have a less variable time series of values than smaller companies. So that's a, a good way to think about risk. It's the the extent to which you have upside and downside movements. There is a concept of risk called systematic risk that I'll cover later on in the video series and that is uh, called beta and that is related to the the equity risk uh, of a company but for now we're just going to talk about general risk and that is the variance. So how do we calculate the variance? Well the variance is calculated using this formula and it looks complex uh, at first but it's actually fairly intuitive. What you're doing is you're trying to capture upside and downside movements and a, a good measure of risk uh, or variance is that the larger the upside and downside movements, the larger the risk measure. And variance does that. Now, how does it do that? Well, first of all, it looks at each observation and its deviation from the mean set of observations. And looking at the formula, you've got the first observation minus the mean, the second observation minus the mean, the third observation minus mean, and so on. Now, if you do that uh, and then add these up, Let's say the mean for the FTSE 250 is roughly about um, 240 here. And upside deviations will be positive, downside deviations will be negative. Now if you add those together, the, up, the positives and the negatives cancel each other out. And so that's not a good risk measure because you could have a lot of variability, a lot of upside, a lot of downside, but adding them together you get a small number. So the variance formula squares those deviations so that whether you have an upside or whether you have a downside, you've still got a positive squared deviation. So then you can add those up and that means that the greater the variability, the greater the measure of risk. And you can see that's what happens here. It's just the squared deviation added together. And then we get the, the last point, which is dividing it by the number of observations minus one. Why do we take away the number of observations, uh, one from the number of observations? Well, that's because we have a sample and we're using time series data with our sample period. And, and this, um, on the screen here, you can see that it's December 95 and it goes all the way up to April 2014. We, ha we do have data before December 95 and we will have data beyond April 2014. In fact, I'm doing this video now in the, the end of May 2014. So, you know, the period, the data will go on, so that means that we only have a sample, and the formula then subtracts one to reflect the degrees of freedom. Now, I won't go into more detail in that in this, this video, but if you're interested, then look up any statistics book, or uh, even just on YouTube, uh, look on uh, a YouTube video on variance. If you have a population, and that means that you're looking at the population and there'll be no more observations, then you wouldn't subtract one. Now, 
going through a, a, a small scale example just now, you see that uh, the we've got returns on Chinese uh, stock market between 2007 and 2011. It's a very variable stock market. Um, the Chinese market is, you know, the, the market really jumps high and it also drops low. And you can see that. 2007, it nearly doubled in value. And then it nearly lost all its value in 2008. And then went away back up in 2009. And 2010, 2011, it was just uh, dropping. Um, so not great performance over uh, those last two years. We then go uh, find, well, okay, the... You get the, the mean, and the mean return over that period was 14.92%. It was 14.92%, but there was really high deviations, really low deviations uh, in that period. We subtract the mean from each of the observations, we square it, and then we divide by 1, uh, 5, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 observations minus 1, which is 4, and that gives us 1.8088. Now, there's another measure of uh, risk called standard deviation, and standard deviation is simply the square root of the variance. So we take the square root of the variance, it's 1.3449, and the standard deviation is in the same units as the underlying series, so it's 134%. And that is how you calculate uh, the, the variance. Okay, now we're going to talk about value at risk, which is a, a risk measure that is very common in the, the banking sector, but not used at all really in the corporate sector. However, I think it is a very good measure and it captures some of the concepts of risk that maybe variance doesn't capture. And specifically, it concentrates on downside risk. Downside risk instead of uh, both upside and downside, which the variance measure does. So what is the definition of value at risk? Value at risk is, the, as you can see in the slides, uh, the potential loss in an asset's value within a specified time period with a specified probability. Now, let's just go through each of uh, the points in that one sentence. It's the potential loss on an asset's value within a specified time period, and with a specified probability. So three things, the potential loss, the specified time period, and with a specified probability. So if we look at an example then of a VAR, uh, a VAR would be 100 million euros, and the holding period is one week, and the probability of loss, in this case, is 5%. So what you've done is you set the holding period, you set the probability, and with those holding period and probabilities, your VAR is 100 million euros. Now, there are many ways in which you can calculate value at risk. Um, the way in which the banking sector uh, calculates value at risk is known as stochastic simulation method. The stochastic simulation method is like the Monte Carlo simulation method that I have covered in an earlier video. I won't be going into that in any depth. What I'll be doing is just showing a, a very brief example of a value at risk using a, a basic method uh, for illustration purposes called the analytical method of value at risk. It's pretty good. Any analysis I've actually done with real data uh, comparing the stochastic simulation and um, historical method, which is another method of value risk, and uh, just the analytical method, you do get fairly similar results. So, but, you know, um, with the regulation, and you're dealing in billions of, of euros or billions of pounds, then clearly you have to go with the, the, the best and um, model that you can go with. And in a lot of cases, you don't actually have a lot of data. And so stochastic simulation method uh, is more appropriate in that case. So this is just an example method. It's not uh, the, the most complex method or the best method, but it's, um, it's, it's straightforward for illustrative purposes. Now I want you to look at this graph, which is a histogram of annual UK equity returns for about 210 years. Now, you can see that it's bell-shaped. It looks bell-shaped. Uh, you have um, some 
negative returns, which you've got one about 55%, uh, minus 55%, and then you've got quite a lot of high positive returns. Now, this is a 210-year period that we're looking at, and you could say, well, the distribution of UK equity returns is positively skewed. Because this is percentages, you can't get any lower than minus 100%. Um, anyway, so it is limited at the bottom and unlimited at the top. But, you know, you saw that the minimum return is minus 55%, and there has been a very high return greater than 60% in one of those years. You could argue that, well, you're looking at 210 observations here. If you looked at 2,100 observations, would you get closer to a bell curve or a normal distribution? Well, we just don't know yet because we, don't, we haven't lived for... 100 years more, and uh, we won't live for 100 years more. So, uh, again, it could be that we're moving towards a normal distribution, or it, it may not be. Now, what we in the analytical method does is it, you, it assumes that the distribution of returns is normally distributed. So, clearly, it's you know it's not. This is positively skewed. Um, but the assumption there is that it's normally distributed, and if a distribution is normal, then you can describe that distribution fully using just two measures. Those two measures are mean and standard deviation. And standard deviation, I have just explained what that is in uh, just a few minutes ago. So you can explain everything about the distribution using those two measures. And the way in which you, you can describe a distribution is by saying, what percentage of observations occur within a number of standard deviations of the mean. So forget about the figures, uh, the percentage figures at the bottom. That's linked to the example I used in, in the textbook. But what I want you to focus on is the zero, the minus one, sigma, plus one sigma. Sigma is the symbol for standard deviation. And so what we see is if a distribution is normally distributed, then 68.26% of all observations that you'll see will be within one standard deviation of the mean. You then can say that 95.44% uh, of all observations will be within two standard deviations of the mean. And 99.74% of all observations will be within three standard deviations of the mean. Now, value at risk only focuses on the downside risk. So it's not really interested in the upside risk. So if we say that, say, 99% of all observations are within a certain number of standard deviations from the mean, then that means that 1% of all, uh, all observations are outside of that. So that means that those observations are in the tail. So if we look at uh, this case and we say that 99.74% observ of observations are within three standard deviations of the mean, that means that 0.26% of all observations are in the tail. And the tail is greater than three standard deviations away from the mean. So 0.26%, that is 1 minus 0 0.9974. 0.26% of all observations are in the tail. And if we then just want to look at the downside risk, what the, the one of the tails, then we've got to half that. We've got to divide that by two, which would be 0.13% of all observations are in the tail. Now, the analytical method of value at risk wants to focus on, they, they say, well, going back to the definition, the potential loss in an asset's value with a specified time period with a specified probability, if we were to say 5% probability, and that means that the what the loss would be in the tail, it would be the 5% tail, given that the distribution is um, symmetric, then you're saying 10% on, on this side, 10% on that side. So 
no, sorry, 5% in this side, 5% in that side, which gives 90% of all observations inside the boundary, 5% here, 5% there. And in value at risk, we only really look at 1%. So if there's 1% here, that means that here there's all 99%. But given that we're dis uh, we are symmetric, you would uh, to follow the same type of logic, then we would have 1% here, 1% there, that's 2%. And so what we want to do is we want to find the number of standard deviations uh, from the mean that where there are 98% of all observations uh, in that boundary. And the number is 2.33. So 2.33 standard deviations from the mean uh, contain 98% of all observations. And that means that there's 2% in the tails, 1% in the downside, and 1% in the, the upside. So our key number here is 2.33. And what we're going to do is we're going to say, well, okay, value at risk is really the value which is at 2.33 standard deviations here. If we were wanting a, a smaller probability loss, then we would be working about here. But with the 1%, it's going to be 2.33. So let's look at an example then. So you've invested 1 million euros in the Alliance RCM Europe Small Cap Equity Fund. So that's a fund, it's a portfolio. Uh, it's of small companies, that's what small cap means. And it's based in Europe. What we're asking is, what is the value at risk? So the value at risk, we're looking at holding period and we're looking at um, the percentage probability. So we've got 1% probability and the holding period is one month. Now we need some data on this fund. And I went to Morningstar to get this data. And you can see that there's uh, the, the return on this fund is 19.84% and the standard deviation is 24.08%. That, the other, that if, if the distribution is normal, then using the, this two data uh, figures, you can describe everything about that d distribution. And what we're going to do is we're going to use those with the special number of 2.33 to work out the value at risk. So the first thing we have to do is we need to work out the returns for the holding period. And the question was um, the monthly returns. So that's the... So it's monthly. I notice I've written weekly there. We need to make sure that's changed. That doesn't appear in the book. Um, so we find the monthly mean and standard deviation of returns. The, we've only got the annual. So to get the monthly, we just divide the annual return by 12. So that gives us the mean monthly return of 1.65%. And to find the monthly standard deviation when you've got the annual standard deviation, you've got to divide it by the square root of 12. Uh, that is 24.08%. I get the 24.08% here. Divided by the square root of 12, and that is equal to 6.95. So that's the first step. We've got the monthly return, and we've got the standard deviation of monthly returns. Now, the next thing is, is we actually want to calculate the percentage bar. So the formula we would use is the mean return minus 2.33. Remember, that's the, the key number, and that's the number of standard deviations below the mean uh, that represents 1% tail. So it's minus 2.33 multiplied by the standard deviation, which is 6.95%. You can see the figures there. So that gives us... Uh, monthly var of 14.54%. But that we're not finished there. So that's like, you could say that's the, the, the 1%. You know, we will lose 14% over the next month with a 1% probability. But we've invested 1 million euros. So given that we've invested 1 million euros, the actual var would be 14.54% times 1 million, which is 140,000 euros. And that would be the measurement of the VAR. Now, if that appears too much for you, then you would want to reduce the risk of your portfolio. So that's a very simple uh, way to look at VAR. And um, thank you very much.